The NASDAQ is supposed to generate high returns, so why does QQQ have an annual rate of return of only 8.62%? Things are not always what they seem. Whenever you see an update on the stock market, it is usually a big graphic showing how the big three market indices are doing, the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. Of those three, the NASDAQ has historically been the most volatile, but in recent years it has had huge upside due to its tech-heavy weightings. The NASDAQ Composite is a massive index with thousands of funds. It's made up of the companies traded on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange, with just a few exceptions. This exchange in the 50 years since its inception has grown to become the second largest exchange in the world, second to none but the NYSE with over $16 trillion in market cap of listed companies. For some perspective, that's nearly as large as the economy of China, whose GDP is just shy of $18 trillion. But what if you don't want to invest in those thousands of companies? What if you just want the top 100? Why wouldn't you? 100 is a nice number. It's simple and clean, and it still gets you 90% of the entire NASDAQ composite index. It makes sense. So in 1985, the NASDAQ did just that. They added the NASDAQ 100 index, known as NDX, to represent the largest domestic and international 100 non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ. Hey folks, I'm Daniel. Let's dig into all things NASDAQ, Invesco, and QQQ. I'm going to cover everything from what the index is, what it's not, dividends, rate of return to expect, the fund holdings, expense ratios, and so much more coming up now. Let's go. The history of cubes or the triple Qs can be a bit confusing because some online sources will say that QQQ started in 2011 or in 2006, but that's not correct. The timing of its inception is important and I'll address why that's important in greater detail later. Its inception changes whether we're looking at 8% average annual returns or double that. QQQ underwent a name change in 2011 and it was formerly known as QQQQ. Then Invesco purchased power shares and took over QQQQ in 2006, but fun documents show it was founded in March of 1999. The technical name is the Invesco QQQ Trust. Companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, and Fidelity tend to gobble up the attention of the investing world, but Invesco has made quite a name for themselves. With nearly $1.5 trillion in assets under management, they're number 17 in the world and number 12 in the US. They're a major player. QQQ is by far their largest fund, with about $200 billion invested, which equates to about 13.5% of that $1.5 trillion in assets under management. This fund, by a wide margin, leads the pack for them and as you can see here, is accessible on most large trading platforms. Getting access to it shouldn't be difficult. So the first thing to keep in mind here is that you cannot invest in an index. If you want to mirror an index, you have to buy a fund that is benchmarked to an index. QQQ allows you to do this. In exchange for Invesco being able to create a fund that is indexed to the NASDAQ 100, they pay a small license fee to NASDAQ to be able to use their data to help match those top 100 holdings for weighting and rebalancing. The fund has a 0.2 percent expense ratio. Put another way, that is 20 basis points. 100 basis points equals 1%. Of that 20 basis points that you can pay to invest in QQQ, 8 basis points goes directly to NASDAQ off the top to pay for that license. They have to get their cut. The remaining 12 basis points go to marketing or trust management related expenses. On an investment of $10,000, you'll pay 20 bucks. Though not the lowest, it's a very reasonable expense ratio. So what do you get with QQQ? The only way you can truly understand this is by hitting the like button and subscribing to my channel so that you're always in the know about the investing world. Earlier you may have noticed that I mentioned it was the top 100 non financial holdings. The reason for this is because the NASDAQ has another index called the NASDAQ Financial 100, the majority of which is banks, but also includes some insurance and financial companies like T. Rowe Price and Zillow. Because of this separation, investing in any NASDAQ 100 index fund like QQQ, you need to be aware you're missing out on any financials. That can be good and bad. Financials are heavily regulated and as a result, they can't innovate as quickly. At the same time, they have tended to be a bit more stable. The weighting of the fund is based on market capitalization. As long as the companies are listed exclusively on the NASDAQ, have average daily volume of 200,000 shares, and have been listed on the market for at least three months, it will qualify. Just over half of the index is information technology, which includes companies like Microsoft, 
Apple, Nvidia, and many more. 16% is in communications, which is what they're considering Meta, Alphabet, which is just Google's parent company, Netflix, and others. I think you can make a decent argument that some of these are information technology companies as well, but I didn't design these categories. I know it's shocking that they didn't ask me for my opinion here. Consumer discretionary makes up another 15% with Amazon, Tesla, and Starbucks leading the way. That's followed up with nearly 6% in healthcare, 5% in consumer staples, 4% in industrials, and then less than 2% in utilities, payment processing, and energy. The top 10 holdings account for 59% of the whole fund, and the top 20 holdings make up 71%. As the top 10 holdings of the NASDAQ 100 go, so goes QQQ. This is not a fund you want to invest in if your goal is to live off the dividends. It has a 12 month dividend of just over a half of a percent. That dividend is paid out quarterly. Dividend paying companies tend to be steady, stable companies with solid cash flow. That's how they return value to you, the shareholder. They're not really delivering value to their shareholders if they pay you a high dividend, but that results in them being starved of cash that they could use to reinvest. QQQ is definitely blue chip, but most of the companies are not defined as slow and steady. Instead, they're companies that invest heavily in growth, research and development, and innovation. This often results in aggressive bursts of growth. These companies tend to reinvest most of their cash back into the business. As a result, this is the kind of fund you want to invest in for long-term capital appreciation versus any kind of income from a dividend. The fund has matched the underlying index very closely, only slightly underperforming the index at 8.62% in average annual returns since its inception. I've got to be honest here, I was really surprised that it was this low. It's not that I expected it to average 20% or something astronomical, but I expected it to be maybe 12 or 13% just because of how explosive the NASDAQ has been over the past decade. But after looking at the history of the fund, I understand it now. If we take a look at the exception of QQQ in 1999, it started right before the dot-com bubble burst. QQQ took off like a rocket with three years of explosive growth before it started to free fall. It took 15 years for them to return to their original high. In this 15 year period, they significantly underperformed the S&P 500. However, once they surpassed the S&P, they haven't looked back. Since then, they've created even more separation, handing investors an impressive average annual return of 17.7% over the past 10 years. So earlier I mentioned that I would clarify why this fund only delivers 8% returns, and now you can see why. The answer involves a bit of nuance. I tend to look at the life of the fund as long as it's greater than 10 years. I'm just conservative by nature and I don't like to pretend that things didn't happen just to make myself feel better about an investment. But I also understand that technology has transformed things and that the world we're living in now is not the world we were living in back in the late 90s and early 2000s. I can understand if people tend to look at the trailing 10 years as a guide for whether to invest in a fund. The strongest argument that I can make that QQQ will continue to climb is that the NASDAQ 100, since its inception, has averaged 17.5% annualized returns. QQQ just started out at a bad time and has about 15 years of mediocre performance before really kicking it into high gear. You make the call. If capital appreciation is your goal and you're okay with the volatility of these aggressive growth companies, QQQ is where you probably want to be. Here you can see that the swings have been significant, with the fund returning double digit gains in six of the last 10 years. We had a bit of a correction in 2022, which offset some of the obscene growth that we've seen in the previous three years of 39, 48, and 27%. The biggest takeaway I can give you on this fund is to make sure that you have risk tolerance and the risk capacity to sustain multiple down years of double digit losses. Although this is a chart of the NASDAQ as a whole, QQQ will capture 90% of this, so it won't be far off. You can see that with 50 years of data going all the way back to the inception of the NASDAQ, that it's nothing at all to experience a 20 or 30% drop. If you're going into retirement and you're heavy in QQQ, just do some quick math and figure out if if you'd be content drawing down 4% of whatever your portfolio is after a 30 or 40% drop. If you can live with that number and you have a ton of cash to hold you over in case you don't wish to sell at a bad time, I can see that argument. If you're 20 years from retirement looking for a fund to invest where you can hopefully be awarded with some really aggressive growth, QQQ might be the fund for you. As always, keep in mind that I'm not a financial advisor or a fiduciary in any capacity. If you want professional advice, I'd recommend a fee-only financial advisor 
that is a fiduciary. That just means that they have to put your financial best interest ahead of their own. This is different from someone who is not a fiduciary who can recommend products that are suitable for you, but not necessarily in your best interest. 